More than 24,000 homes, farms, schools, and businesses in Nevada and Placer counties. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Nevada County Interviews. I'm your host, Paul Minacucci, and tonight we are going to be talking with uh, two football stars from Nevada County who have come into the studio to talk about a very serious issue, traumatic brain injury among football players, and what can we do about that? So uh, this is part three of a eight-part series. Uh, on traumatic brain injuries that we are running. So I want to welcome George Visker and Kevin Brown to the studio. All right. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you so much for coming down and mm -hmm. for pleasure. sharing your stories. Absolutely. So, George, let's start with you. I would like to know a little bit about more about you. Uh, you're a Californian, right? I am. I am born and raised in Stockton. Um, went to a Stag High, and then, uh, then I left. To right. Colorado. So. so tell me, why did you choose Colorado? Um, growing up in Stockton, and I lived in what was known as the hottest house in the world. Uh -huh. I wanted to play somewhere that was cold. <laughs> um, and I'm an avid, avid, avid outdoorsman. So uh, I was a decent ball player in good grades, and I had a lot of scholarship offers, and I wanted to go somewhere I could not only play ball and get a good education, I wanted to be able to do a little hunting and fishing. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was my main Right. Great. Yeah. And then we'll talk a little bit more about how you got involved at pro football level. Yeah. Kevin, tell us about where you come from. Um, I'm from Independence, Missouri. And um, after I graduated from high school, um, actually I came out uh, west to California and uh, went to a junior college in San Diego and then got a scholarship to the University of Idaho. And why did you choose the Vandals? Well, um, they had a, a passing offense. They started five wide receivers and had a dome stadium and an All-American quarterback. So right. pretty easy choice for a wide receiver. <laughs> right. And you also returned kicks in college, did you? I did. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, so George, you went on to uh, play for the uh, – you were drafted by the Jets in 1980 round <laughs> six. Is that right? Correct. And then you ended up with the 49ers? Yeah, the uh, so with the Jets, uh, I got cut at the end of preseason, and then um, I actually did a quick little stint. I didn't realize, but the Canadian League has a draft along with the NFL. Mm -hmm. So the day I, I get home from New York, uh, Calgary had called, and I guess they had drafted me, and they wanted me. And their season starts early, so they were right. already into their season. So um, <clears throat> they wanted me up for a two-week trial. Uh, I knew I could break in the NFL. I needed to find the right place that right. needed me, and so I talked to my agent. He said, "Go back there and." Play in shape for a couple of weeks, and someone will probably pick right. you up. So I went up to Canada for a couple of weeks and practiced. One of the two Rough Riders in the Canadian Football League. You know, actually, when I was up there, um, uh, their quarterback um, Anderson was an old ex-Colorado player oh, too. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So then you ended up with the 49ers Niners, in 1980. Yeah, they picked me up uh, um, right before the first Dallas game. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So, so Kevin, when you, you uh, came out of Idaho, you didn't get drafted. I did not. Um, actually, I had an extra year of eligibility, which I um, spent one season at uh, Humboldt State as well mm -hmm. and uh, to try to get more film and more opportunities uh, to get, uh, you know, in the NFL spotlight as far as, uh, you know, scouting and whatnot. And... As a free agent, um, I had a former player who actually played with the 49ers, uh, Dan Otick, acted as my agent, agent, got me an opportunity down in Arizona, and was doing pretty well during the camp, got injured, and then spent a year over 
in Europe. Yeah, who did you play for in uh, Europe and Germany? Was it was it? Rams. Yeah. It was a Rams affiliate uh, in actually Nuremberg. Nuremberg. Yeah. Right. And um, and and so both of you um, actually had your careers cut short because of injuries. Is that yes. fair statement? Yes. So. So here we are in 1980, uh, and you're uh, playing Dallas in Dallas. And uh, I, I think you mentioned to me Doug Cosby earholed you on a play. And I don't know if it was Cosby or not. Um, he came in after me. It was um, Jay Salvia, if I remember correctly. Oh, Jay Salvia. Yeah. Uh, that's 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 ironic. My sister used to go out with him in high school. Is that right? Really? <laughs> Tell her that. Uh, <laughs> pass the word on to him. That, yeah, uh, he, still, I still think of him. Still think about him, huh? <laughs> I don't know. He, he's as big as you are, so I'm not sure I want to I don't remember how anywhere. big he was, but I know that uh, they told me not to hit me. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, when you got hit, what, what immediately happened? Were you out, knocked out completely? It was, uh, you know, I played defensive tackle. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I, I came in, it was a, and it was a short week that week, too. It was a Saturday game. It was a game of the week. So the way it works in the NFL, Tuesdays, your days off, and that's when they bring guys in and work you out. So I had actually come in and worked out on Tuesday. And then Denver wanted me in for a workout, so I actually flew to Denver that afternoon, and I was working out for them the next morning, and then the Niners signed me, and I flew back. I was on the field practicing Wednesday, Thursday. Friday, we fly to Dallas, so I, I knew very little of the playbook. Right. Um, and then uh, Saturday, we're playing uh, early in the first quarter. You know, I, I go in, and um, it was a trap. Right. And, um, so basically, I go flying upfield. and. Uh, All right. The Dallas, that, tra Dallas trap where they put their tight end in motion. They bring right. Them in, yeah. Yeah. The trap play is to try to you open a hole up, a guard or something. Well, they, don't, they, don't, they don't block you. They, yeah, they, they don't block the you, and then that's what the field. trap is. And they give you a, what looks like a free shot. But right, they, right. They take advantage of your momentum. Exactly. Yeah. And so uh, did you, were you out cold on the field? Or? You know, I don't know. I know that they told me afterwards that I went through 25 to 30 smelling salts during the game. Right. Um, I can remember bits and pieces of it. I would, what I would remember really most vividly were um, on the sidelines when I'd crack a couple of them and then start to get my head clear and then maybe remember a little bit of a play or two and then, you know, a couple of good shots. And I'd still play, but wouldn't remember anything. And this, you know, then you're watching game films the next day, and coaches are asking, "What are you doing here?" Right. Uh, you know, I don't know. You know? Right. So it was a not a good game for the Niners. Fifty-nine to fourteen. No, it wasn't. It, you know, <laughs> yeah, I knew it was a blow. I couldn't remember right. what the score was. Right. But, uh, so, um, what? T take us through a little bit um, of, of what the history is after that. So you're so you're now uh, you played the Dallas game. Uh, when were you, did you, so, so obviously you were diagnosed with a concussion. No. No, you weren't. No. Okay, so I should think. Never missed a practice. No, you know. You didn't miss any practice. No. Okay. I mean, the, the smelling salts really to just clear my sinuses, I think, so I could smell a little better. <laughs> right. But, uh, and um, <clears throat> so there, during that week of practice, were you able to concentrate enough to learn any, any of the playbook? You know, to tell you the truth, I, I can't remember. Uh, maybe that's, maybe that's why I don't remember, but. Um, All right. Um, I don't know. Um, I mean, I still have my old playbook, and uh, I've got some notes in there and things. So, did you get back on the field the next game? Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, and and how long did you play that year? What was the I well, think that was the sixth game of the year, as I recall. But something like that. Yeah. So they brought me in. I played two or three games, and uh, it was kind of a revolving door back then. We made I think 32 roster changes that season after the final cut day. So right. every week there was two or three guys in and out. So I was there for, I don't know, two or three games, and then they cut me, and then they brought me back a couple of weeks later for the last several games of the season. Um, so I don't, there was a little little stint in there. I wasn't playing. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, I played in every game that I suited up for. Right. Um, I didn't start. I wasn't a starter, but um, right. you know, I played. And so at the end of that season, uh, take us through what happened. What happened during the summer? Did you Were you able to do the summer camp? With yeah, the yeah. Um, and in fact, in 81. so 81 season, um, or 81 off season, I uh, actually blew my knee out in mini camp. Um, it popped it out of joint in practice. They, they snapped it back in, told me it was a sprain. Okay, a sprain. So that was, I think, mini camps around May, April or May, isn't it? It was, it yeah. was right after the day after the draft is when it is. Um, and so. Uh, my knee went out a few more times during the off season working out. I'd go and have it drained, you know, 60, 70 cc's of blood, and be off off of it for a week or so. And then, so I came back into camp, and then um, 
early in camp, um, blew my knee out again, right. had knee surgery, and was coming back off of that um, when I started developing my symptoms from my hydrocephalus. Mm -hmm. um, At that point. And then that went into the... And uh, so, Kevin, brief history. You, you told me off camera that you know you had at least four or five diagnosed concussions. Yeah, I'd and say you had some knee problems too. Um, ankle problems. Ankle problems. Yeah, actually, um, in high school, college, I definitely had uh, four or five diagnosed uh, concussions, and I've probably had, you know, ten or fifteen other times where my belt was rung and seeing stars that weren't diagnosed. So, yeah. And you told told me a story that you were working with uh, the Houston Rockets at the time, and you found yourself doing things that were not characteristic of your of your normal life. Yeah, I, I, I would say that most people that know me um, know that I'm pretty laid back, down to earth, and, and very calm. And it was uh, pretty much after I had, um, my last time I played uh, pro ball was 97. And I think I started the job with the Rockets in 99. And I started to know some behavior differences from before, you know, a little bit more aggressive, um, and uh, which wasn't me, and I wasn't quite sure where it was coming from, but, you know, I, I kind of understood in that it was probably years of, you know, right. banging in my head and right. Which we know now of CTE, you know, um, chronic traumatic, traumatic encephalopathy. Yeah. Close enough. Yeah. yeah. CTE. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And, and that is one of, of course, one of the uh, yeah. array of symptoms. So um, we're going to, George, you know, we're going to, uh, I think, use this time now to roll a few of the pictures we have of, of uh, you. Because the truth is that when I asked you how many years of football you played, you said 12 to 14 because you start with Pop Warner football. Correct. Correct. And so you're a 13 year old kid. And Actually, I'm 11 here. This 11 is the, there, the very yeah. first Pee Wee Pop Warner team Stockton ever had. Right. And, uh, and you mentioned that some really good players played with you on this and the other team. I counted them up the other day. There were 29 kids in that team, and three of us signed NFL contracts in 1980. Mm -hmm. All of us played all through high school at Stag, where we were undefeated. Um, but uh, Jack Cosgrove, my best buddy, he signed with the Seahawks in the eighth round. He was eighth round pick in 1980. And then Pat Bow, our tight end, who went on to Stanford, uh, he signed as a free agent with Green Bay. And Pat, I might add, now is the executive president of Cargill International with, oh, wow. with I don't know how many tens of thousands of employees under him. So right. I guess his brain's still working. But, his uh, brain's still working. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we had some players on that team. Right. Yeah. And then, um, and so take me to, so, so it was the next year that you had your concussion? No, it was, it was the two years after that. It was two my, years my after third that. year of Pop Warner. Right. Um, take uh, us through that. What, what happened? Uh, yeah, it was a tackling drill in practice, um, a bull in the ring drill, which was... Um, yeah, tell, a, tell viewers at home what this drill is like. Because I remember it, it, that drill well. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it, it, doesn't, it has no place in football. It, it's right. more of a gladiator drill for the coaches. We, right. uh, they had us in a circle, the whole team you know, maybe 20, 25 yards apart. And half the team was numbered 1 through 25, the other half 1 through 25, and there's a ball in the middle. So when they call out 6, both 6s run out. However you can get the ball across the line, your team gets the point, and the losers run extra sprints. So you had everybody, you know, watching you, making sure you scored. Right. And uh, my number was, was, was called, and I, you know, ran out there. It was... I was going against, I remember Larry Mondragon, he was our fullback. So I knew he was faster than me, so I wasn't going to go for the ball, I was going to go for him. And he would tell me afterwards that he was thinking the same thing. So we just ran 25 yards straight at each other. And of course back then you don't have good technique, you know, and it's top ahead to top ahead. Right. And, um, and uh, I was knocked unconscious. Um, they told me, you know, I, I got up, I told the coaches I was okay, and, and after I was down for a little bit, and they said I took a step or two and then, you know, went flat over on my face. They get me up, I, I say I'm okay, I take two steps, I go over backwards, and they say, you better take him to the hospital. So I was hospitalized on that one, but I was 13. Right. Or, well, how, how old you are in ninth grade. Right. Um, and um, when you played at Stag uh, in high school, um, did... Were the coaches aware of that previous 
concussion? No. 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 I mean, not that I know of. I mean, I coached at the high school level, too, and that's something that you never... You just don't ask. No. I mean, right. I mean, it, yeah. It was never even thought of. Mm-hmm. And it's not, not knocking anything. It just really wasn't right. an issue. Right. Back and then, it, so. back then, we didn't know a lot yeah. about it. <clears throat> so... Um, do we have the picture? Uh, now, I want to get the picture of George uh, uh, at Colorado, which is sitting in front of us. So, uh, George, you were uh, able to, uh, as you mentioned, get a scholarship to Colorado, and you appear in this picture. Is this from the Orange Bowl, or is this a... No, I this think was, it was a uh, league game, huh? Yeah. Um, looks like we're playing Kansas, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was a, a league game. Tell us how your... So, your, the career at Colorado... Uh, did you have, you didn't have any serious concussions? Or no, did I did. Um, uh-huh. I was a three-year starter at Colorado. I started as a true sophomore. Um, and uh, I had, I mean, diagnosed concussions. I had a couple, two or three. Um, never missed any games, never missed any practices for them. But, um, you know, uh, I mean, and in other games where you really don't remember. Things. The problem with a concussion, I tell people all the time, is when you get one, you're the last one to know. Right. People have to tell you that you had a concussion because you think when you don't remember things, you don't know you don't, you don't remember it. Right. So people have to bring it to your attention that mm-hmm. you know you were kind of out there. And um, and so now when you're in Colorado, you you feel like I mean you were uh, were you all league at one point? No, I was I, I made I was honorable mention all Big Eight my um, my soft I mean my uh, senior year. Right, and um, so you you knew you had a shot at the NFL. Yeah, and I, I was in my sophomore year. I was injured. Uh, I, I missed a I, I, I tore an ankle up. I missed two or three games, and I came back and played like a game and a half and blew it out again. So my sophomore year, I was kind of dinged. Um, my junior year, I had a knee that I didn't miss any full games on, but I was playing on a torn up. Me and then, so my senior year was the first full year I played, and um, I had a decent year. Um, and like I said, I was honorable mention all Big Eight. Um, I wasn't anything special though. But I didn't know if we got that cut picture of the of, of George and his Colorado. I did. All right. So, um, and 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 Kevin. So you um, do you have other other than you know possible CTE kinds of involvement? Do you feel other aches and pains from from your surgeries, or? Yes, I do. Um, and in fact, uh, my uh, my first real serious injury was actually during my tryout in Arizona. Um, uh, it was a week away from a big scrimmage we were going to have, and it was I was looking at it as my real opportunity to kind of show what I could do and make the team. I was having a really good camp, and so. I don't know, a week before we, we were doing, uh, I think we were doing a team a team drill, and it was supposed to be sort of non-contact or, you know, not full speed. And I actually yeah, caught a ball about 30 yards down the field, and I, well, got exposed to the speed <laughs> at that level, which was tremendous. And linebackers that are 260 pounds that can run, you know, four fives or four fours was new to me. Uh, anyway, this guy um, was just sort of following the play and uh, and basically kind of jumped on the pile where he jumped on my shoulder. One one shoulder was in the in the ground in the turf and basically almost kind of like a pretzel kind of snapped me and his shoulder was underneath my chin and had a cracked sternum and a punctured lung and dislocated shoulder. So uh, you know, definitely that it was it was a tough blow and actually probably a semi concussion as well. No. Um, I didn't know um, that I was that injured. I knew I was trying to make the team. So, actually, I finished practice, um, you know, trying to show that I had some toughness. And it was the medical staff that actually pulled me to the side as they were reviewing the play on the sideline and said, we want to take a look at you. And I think I was on pure adrenaline. Mm-hmm. And um, they took my, my shoulder pads off and saw that, you know, my yeah. chest was purple and and whatnot, and I was immediately rushed to the hospital. <clears throat> so that kind of ended that opportunity. I did well enough where they had, you know, recommended me to go play over in Europe, and uh, I had a pretty good season over there. Um, no big injuries. I definitely, you know, from the position of playing wide receiver, and then also being a kick returner, 
you're definitely going to have uh, you know you know high, high speed, speed collisions. collisions. Yeah. yeah. And I I definitely had my share of high speed collisions uh, that season and um, and was able to get through the end of the season. Um, but you know as far as being banged up, you know I still have shoulder problems. I had a, a surgery on my shoulder. I uh, had some ankle injuries from turning my ankles. I had two surgeries on my right ankle, which I was recommended I would I should get another one to fully correct it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, every now and then getting out of bed in the morning time is, is tough. Right. So talk, talk to me a little bit about what we hear is the gladiator syndrome, uh, you know, a culture of violence. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, how does that get played out? In a, in a, on a team? You know, I mean, I'm not a, a violent person, but that, that's why I played the game. It was, um, uh, I played 12 or 13 years, whatever it was from Pee Wee Pop Warner on the, into the pros. And I tell people this, I carried the ball one time in my first year at Pee Wee Pop Warner as a tight end. I caught one pass and I had, I had an interception in college. Carried the ball twice in 13 years. So I didn't. I was a lineman. I had my hand in the dirt the whole time, you know. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so I didn't play for. Yeah, I didn't have any of the accolades. And, yeah, I mean, it was scores. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I liked the, the physicality of the game. I, I, right. I, I, and I loved it. I, I um, and it was a love. I mean, I had two passions, and, and that was. And so, how does it get played out? So, you know, you you get dinged up. The last thing in the world you're going to do. Yeah. Does it report that? In, in my 13 years of playing, um, I used to tell people I was never injured until my last year. I never had, of course, I consider surgeries as injuries. If you, if, if you didn't have surgery, they weren't considered injuries. So, uh, and I've always used that term until just, just now. I just realized. But I never was injured, really, in all my years. I had, you know, ankles and knees and things drained and, and, and broken, numerous broken fingers and, you know, and, and what have you. Um, you know, like a handful of concussions over the years. Those weren't never thought of as, as serious. <clears throat> Tell me about uh, how coaches react to that. I mean, what is the stimulus that they would use? Are there encouragement? I mean, you hear about things like bounties and that kind of thing. Oh, uh, yeah. And, I mean, and, 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 you know, but it's clearly the case that uh, you want to be able to pop a guy pretty good, right? I mean, yeah, and not only that, but you want to, um, and again, it's, it's, the, it's the mentality of the game. You want to... Uh, you know, playing through pain was was looked upon as something great. Um, at one point in my career, and I believe it was probably my sophomore year in high school, um, I, I broke two vertebrae in my neck. I have two compression fractures in my C6 and C7. And um, I found out about those in the 80s after I was done playing. Um, to this day, about once a month, my neck will go out and, and these two fingers will go numb on each hand. And I was seeing my neurologist after a brain surgery and... and my neck happened to be out, so they ended up take, taking x-rays and found out. But, I mean, I can remember when I was injured during the game, um, if that was when I actually did it, but it was a big deal to, to be out of practice the next day. You know, I mean, they had a neck brace on me that night, and I took it off, and, it, and the coach was, hey, you know, way to go, way to suck it up. So that, you know, especially as a lineman, too, where you don't yeah. get any other, you know, no one's, right. no one's saying good play. Right. So... Um, you know, those were your accolades, you know, having mm -hmm. the coaches acknowledge that, hey, you know, you're tough and you're sucking it up. Yeah. So that's the whole, I and agree. that's the mentality of the game. Um, Let me ask you a question that I didn't, haven't asked you yet. Um, uh, did you, do you remember plays in which you knocked somebody else out? Oh, yeah. 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 What was that like? Tell me, did... You loved, I mean, really, and again, I'm not a violent person, but that was what the, if it was a good, clean hit, and I wasn't a dirty player, mm -hmm. but a good, clean hit where you laid somebody out, there wasn't anything better. I mean, really, right. especially as a defensive player. Right. Now I played both ways in high school, but as a defensive right. player, that was that was you know you did it. You didn't get any better than that. Right. I mean, really. Yeah. Um, and right. I hate to say it now. I mean, I I really do. <coughs> um, a good clean hit where you right. laid somebody out. Man, that you right. really, nothing felt better. We used to get credit for if you could get a guy off the ground. Jack him up and yeah. yeah. No part of his body is touching the ground. That yeah. was decleater. Yeah. 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 Tell and us you what that's like. You, you got probably on the, more than you Well, <laughs> you know, actually, um, I tried to play offense and wide receiver with, a, you know, a defensive mentality, a physical mentality. Uh, from my sort of size, there were some, 
you know, people that were, you know, playing, uh, you know, professional ball that, you know, I sort of looked up to. One was like Michael Irvin was a big sort of physical receiver. It was right. kind of the start of of a lot of big physical receivers. Uh, Terrell Owens and those guys yeah. came afterwards. And so, um, you know, I thought it was kind of a, an advantage uh, for me to sort of be, you know, a bigger uh, receiver. And uh, in order to be, I thought, successful, I mean, you had to enjoy that part of the game. Right. I mean, I really felt like um, the game didn't really start until, you know, I got hit or there was a big hit. And then it, you know, then it just yeah. got really fun. And the game was on. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I, I, as far as the gladiator part of it, uh, you know, I enjoyed that part just as much as, you know, the glory of, you know, catching a game winner or the first down or helping the team win. Um, and in my experience, actually, in Arizona, you know, I think I went through probably uh, a 10-second, you know, thing with myself as I was laying on the turf, and that gladiator moment came through. Uh, you know, if I get up, you know, I'll show these guys that I'm tough, and then, you know, maybe that'll help me, you know, mm -hmm. make the team. So right. that definitely plays a huge part into right. it. Mm -hmm. right. And I think that we're going to talk about that a little bit, about the pressures that kids in high school feel because there's a very real issue here that if this is my only way out to get to college and get an education, um, there's a lot of incentive not only from the outside but from the inside mm -hmm. you know, to, to stick with it and not, not give up on it. Right. I'm going to yeah. talk a little bit about now. I'm going to change gears a little bit. I, I'm going to read you a promo from a GQ article that uh, came out in October 2000, September 2009, and here's what it says. It says, um, there's a quote, and we know it's from, from uh, yeah, Mike Webster. Well. Yep. How does a guy go from four Super Bowl rings to pissing in his own oven and squirting super glue on his rotting teeth? And that's the billion-dollar question. Retired NFL players are suffering from dementia, depression, and a slew of other seriously debilitating mental symptoms that are affecting the game's heroes at a freakishly high rate. The symptoms go way beyond the traditional punch drunk diagnosis. It's killing them at early ages. There's something serious going on here, and it's only going to get worse. One forensic pathologist from Pittsburgh who we know is Dr. Amalu, we'll talk a little bit about him, appears to have found the cause and wants to create a cure. Independent experts and colleagues have reviewed his work and believe in his conclusions. So why is the NFL making it a mission to discredit and marginalize his research? The answer is straight out of the tobacco company playbook, and it's disgusting. Absolutely. Is there a concerted cover-up in the NFL to keep injured players playing? There has been, but absolutely. If you go back, I don't mean to keep passing this around, yeah, but yeah, if, you, if, if you go back to when Dr. Ira Kasson was the head of the NFL, it was called back then the Mild Traumatic Brain Injury Group. He was the head of it for 23 years. And they had him on 60 Minutes and CNN uh, grilling him repeatedly over the years about you mean there's no correlation between repeated head trauma and long-term cognitive declines in the ex-players? And his, his nickname was Dr. No. Every, every question was no, no, just no. There's no correlation, no. Uh, of course, he was paid by the NFL owners. Mm -hmm. um, so, so do you think that he was just playing the game and understood sort of implicitly what they wanted? Or do you think they really were uh, at the point of... Uh, saying to him, you know, you really need to watch what you're saying here, and you know, I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I, sh I can't say I guarantee it, but um, having been in it even just for a short period of time, there was some very dirty dealings just in, with my own case, and, mm -hmm. and I know four different players, four of my teammates from the '81 season alone, sued the 49ers physicians and surgeons for medical malpractice, and won. There was things that went on. I can imagine back in, and I played against Mike Webster. Right. And those, yeah, I mean, he was my idol as I was growing up as a, as a kid. I can remember I lined up over him when I was with the Jets. I started against him, and I thought this was like one of my my moments. I mean, I'm looking right. at my idol, you know what I mean? And then to hear years later, I read about how he died. 
right. you know, in his truck, using a stun gun on his head to knock himself out because he couldn't sleep at night. That's a sign of CTE. Um, uh, I have the same symptoms at times. I mean, I this last three nights, I bet you I've had a total of maybe four and a half to five hours sleep. Right. Um, but uh, believe me, they've known about this for a long, long time. But uh, you know, once the cat's out of the bag, it's going to change the whole complexity of the game. Right. Um, Let me ask you a question. You, you told me a story about how you were in a locker room after you had a brain surgery uh, with the 49ers, and the general manager, John McVay, happened to be in the locker room. He was showing some folks around, and they asked you why you were there. Yeah, he Tell was introducing them. We were in lifting weights, and he's introducing him to some of the players, and, and um, there were a couple of couples in there. And, uh, you know, he's introducing them. You know, here's Dwight Clark, our tight end, and Joe Montana, and, and this is George Zisker, you know. Um, and he mentioned that I was on injury reserve, and uh, he said I had two knee operations that year. And this woman asked me, two? How'd you have two? And I really thought that he had made a mistake, okay? Um, and I said, no, ma'am, I had a knee surgery and I had a brain surgery. And he looks me right in the eye and tells me, no brain surgery, no, you had two knee operations with a look like, keep your mouth shut or you're out of here. Well, guys were getting cut, they got cut every week. And people don't realize this, you read about these big contracts, they sign a f 10 million five year contract, they owe you 1 16th of that first year's contract each week, and if they cut you after the second week, that big contract is worth 2 16ths of the first year's salary, that's it. Right. So. You sign these contracts, they're nothing, it's just paper. Right. I mean, unless you're there, so they can get rid of you anytime they want. They hold that over your head. They hold it over your head that there's 10,000 guys looking for your job. Right. So you'll play when you're injured. And, and so uh, prior to that, I knew that they were treating me weird. There was something going on. I, I didn't know. Right. Um, and that was right before we went to the Super Bowl. And, of course, they didn't want anything rocking the boat. Right. Um, I don't know how far. I mean, I could go on and on. Right. I don't want to spend too much time on it. Kevin, um, in your entire career, did anybody ever say to you, you know, we're playing this game and you have to understand, you know, the technique has to be right because you could be seriously injured. You could, you could uh, end up Daryl Stingley, wide receiver. Yeah. Does anybody ever say that to you? Um, no. I mean, the only thing I think I really heard coaches say, which uh, probably... Uh, when I got in college was, you know, to try to keep your head up. Um, you know, I heard, you know, many different coaches say that. Um, as far as technique, you know, for my position, you know, there wasn't... Uh, right, you weren't hitting guys. You know, I wasn't hitting guys, so it wasn't about, you know... Um, but what I did hear, in, in fact, when I got to, um, you know, that camp in Arizona was um, to get down. Right. And uh, I had heard that, you know, sort of watching, you know, a few NFL games before. But during the camp, there was a few uh, close calls right. where guys were repeatedly telling me, you know, Kevin, get down. You know, yeah, you yeah. know, don't try to, you know, drag uh, 50 people like Mark Rivaro, you know, 30 yards. I mean, right. you got yeah. guys that, you know, are spearing and trum coming after you. So, you know, so get down was right. the other thing I heard. And we knew, everybody knows that a quarterback who throws high over the middle is not very yeah. popular with his receiving <laughs> core. No, he yeah. is not. But, yeah. you know, let's take the case of uh, just this last year, James Harrison, the linebacker of Pittsburgh, right. who who had a big issue with the NFL because they started implementing what was already on the books, you know, a head-to-head -head collision with a defenseless player. And he was saying, well, this is a big part of my game, right? Right. If a, if a wide receiver knows he's going to get, you know, laid out coming right. over the middle, right. he's not going to come over the middle. Right. You're going to get, you know, alligator arms, as they That's call right. it. That's and right. That's right. so how much of a part of the, the game how aware were you of like linebackers? Uh, was, were the was, guys that you knew were going to hit you harder than someone else? Yeah, you know, and I think the first sort of prominent player I played against uh, was in high school, and he also uh, made it to the NFL. His name is Jason Belzer. Um, he was uh, a defensive back. Um, ended up going to the University of Oklahoma. Was a first round draft pick. I played you know many years in NFL and. Uh, he was the first person that I remember being aware of because we had some epic battles and, uh, you know, he would do well. I'd catch maybe six or seven balls in a game, but, you know, Jason would show up with his hard hat and, and really put a hit on me. And then 
Um, not really until I, you know, got to you know University of Idaho and I and I saw, you know, how big and strong and fast linebackers were. And um, but you know I think, you know, it's it's like you said, it's part of the gladiator sort of mindset that you have to have. And, and if you don't have that, then you're not going to be successful. So I mean, you know, I kind of took it as just part of the game. Now, um, so we've talked all along because yeah, a lot of people say, well, okay, it's the NFL. And, you know, that's just part of the guts and glory. But the truth is that the NFL has an impact on everybody below it, has an mm -hmm. impact on college, has an impact on high school. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of a high school player, um, what is the impact of the NFL? I mean, how is that? Is it, do you think that the gladiator mentality is as strong in the high school Absolutely. I mean, I go back to Mike Webster playing in Pop Warner. Even if you go back to those pictures, you know we had black and gold uniforms, just like the Pittsburgh Steelers. And we would—I can remember in practice, you know, I'm John Cole, I'm Mike Webster. We would emulate these guys. And um, I can only imagine what it's like now with the publicity and all the, right. the FaceTime these guys get yeah. on. You know, they zoom in during the game, and you can see them, John, and 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 talking. Um, and, and, and I mean, the kids see that, and, and they think, you know, hey, that's what I want to do. I mean, I did as a, as a, as a right. young player. And so obviously, if the, you know, when you multiply that out towards how many high school football oh, players yeah. there are who are getting concussions and serious right. head injuries yeah. on a regular basis, yeah. Yeah. it's a big issue yeah. for America it's that's huge. just not being addressed. It's huge. Yeah. yeah. It's and not. people don't really, people picture a concussion as being knocked out. Okay. Um, concussion, and, and you and I were talking about this, you know, we've probably had thousands, of, you know, when you hit hard enough to see stars, that's your brain concussing against the right. skull. So I was, I think I mentioned to you earlier, I, I, I do a lot of motivational goal setting talks and things, and I was down at um, Stag High School, my old alma mater, a year or two ago, a couple years ago, and um, talking to some of the guys, and NPR happened to be doing a show on it, and w they were interviewing them, are any of you ever worried about, you know, head injuries? And one of their players, I remember he, he chimed in, he says, no, you know, uh, and they asked so, so something to the effect that, you know, well, how do you know you really, you know, laid a lick on a guy? And he goes, oh, you can really tell when you, when you hit him so hard you see stars. You know, and I, I just cringed. I was thinking, you know, these guys don't even know. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's looked upon as, right. hey, th that great job. You know, yeah. did you see stars on that one? Yeah, I did. Yeah. All right, good job, you know. So that's, uh, you know, and I think. Now, what, now we, I want to step back to, but that was back in my days. Now right. I. Th I I, I pray to God. It's, I, I think they're much more cognizant and they're aware. We didn't know those were concussions. Right. I mean, no, I really no. didn't until just recently. No. I always used to tell people, well, I had one in Pop Warner. I had, you know, maybe a couple in high school, and I, I could count them off. But now... So tell us about this this new thing, the subacute concussion. And I know Dr. Amalu talks about that, does he not? Yeah, Amalu, um, what they're finding out now, um, see, Amalu has Dr. Julian Bales on his board. Right. Um, Dr. Bales was the Pittsburgh Steelers physician for 10 years or, or over, and he was there back when Webster was there. But um, now they're finding out it's not even, it's not even the concussions. It's the, it's the multitude of sub-concussive hits. Right. You don't even need to see stars. It's just the repeated pounding. Right. Um, I mean, dementia pugilista is, is, is dementia, and punch drunk is where that came from, from the boxers, okay? Well, they didn't need to get knocked out every, every fight, you know? Okay. You, you beat a guy's head yeah. enough times, yeah. he may never even been knocked out, but yet he develops, you know, dementia right. pugilista. Um, right, and you got ten years Muhammad out. Ali. <laughs> exactly. See, Sugar Ray Robinson, I mean, you had some right. of the greats of boxing. Well, you, yeah, that's a good point. Muhammad Ali, you know, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. NFL players have an 800 times higher rate of developing ALS than the general public. Right. That's not a coincidence. And Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. I mean, you know, at a higher I'll, level, early onset. I'll be perfectly honest here, um, and my wife cringes when, I'm, when I state these things, but I'm 52 years old, and as of a month or so ago, a couple months ago, they had me on four different dementia medicines at once. Um, and I'm trying to run my environmental consulting business when I'm taking Aricept, Namenda, Lamectal, and Risperidol. You know, I'm 52 for crying out loud. And, you know, um, yeah. I qualify for no benefits from the NFL. You know? right. right, we're going to talk about that. So, yeah. so you had nine brain surgeries. Yes. And during that all that time, when you were having those brain surgeries, how did the uh, 49ers treat you? <laughs> 
Uh, now you're opening up a whole can of worms. We tell it like it is. I, I will. I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep this thing as short as I can. Um, uh, we go to the Super Bowl in January of, of 81. No, January of 82. It was the 81 season. So we win the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 16. That was, and I had my first brain surgery early in the season, having some weird symptoms after it. Um, so we win the Super Bowl that spring, that May, so four months after the Super Bowl. Now I'm having some real problems. And I go back and see the team doctors. They send me down to Stanford where I had my first brain surgery. They do a, a brain scan on me. They tell me I'm fine. And I thought I was still playing. They t when I'm in the hospital having my, after my first brain surgery, the trainers are calling me saying, hey, Visk, we're looking at having a special made hunt, uh, helmet to protect your shunt because I, I developed hydrocephalus. And, you know, they drilled a hole in my skull. There's a tube in there. There's a pressure valve in the back of my head, and there's a tube that goes down to my abdomen. It's permanent now. So they were going to make a helmet for me, they said, and protect my shunt. And so I was all for playing. And you understand the mentality. Yeah. It's like, hey, they say I'm good. I'm good. You know. Mm -hmm. So... Four months after the Super Bowl, my shunt goes out. I go into a coma. I'm in Mexico, of all places, fishing with my brother Mel. He brings me home. I'm, they reoper we get a new doctor here in town, um, uh, or actually in town. I'm thinking I'm Sacramento in Sacramento. Dr. Cobb operates on me, and 10 hours later, I'm comatose again. They rush me back in, give me a third brain surgery, give me last rites. Um, I'm in intensive care for I don't know how long. I, I really don't remember that first year. Um, really doing some bizarre things. Um, the, one of my first memories, though, a, a year or so after, is I started getting hospital bills. Right. And I'd write on them, and there were several hundred thousand dollars. And keep in mind, I made, um, and I'm not complaining, but I made, I think, 79000 my last year playing. That was with two playoff games and the Super Bowl money. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like, right. I mean, guys had jobs in the off season. And so, naturally, when you came to put, you know, give the 49ers the bill. They paid it, did they? Oh, sure. I, I, so I would write on it, please bill San Francisco 49ers, and I wrote it so many times, I still remember their address. Yeah. It was 7-Eleven, Nevada Street, Redwood City, California. And they... I'd send it to them, I'd get it back from them a week or so later, and they would have circled the total, and they would just write on it, you owe this amount. Now, this right. is just four months after I'd spent a couple seasons with them. Right. Not even a card, sorry, this, hey, sorry to hear you're back in the hospital. I had creditors on me for five years, almost five years. Right. And I had to take them, I had to sue them for a workman's comp. Right. And, and at that point, they gave in and said yes. <laughs> no. They took me so far as to put me on stand, right. and their attorney comes out and he has my last day's practice schedule from 1981. And the full day is scripted out. You know, you get there at 7.15 in the morning, whatever it was, 8.15 in meetings. And so he's going through the whole day and he's going through the practice schedule. As a defensive lineman, and that's some bolts of practice, it, it, every play is just about is, is head contact. So once we got into that part of it, you know, um, I mean, it was a slam dunk. The, ju the judge just said, you know, why are we here? But in the meantime, I had the two brain surgeries that creditors on me, and the knee surgery they did on me, which they had kept telling me for weeks or months there was nothing wrong with it. Finally, Coach Walsh told Dr. Bailing to op at least scope it. So what does he do? He takes me in, doesn't even scope it. And I thought he had scoped it. Years later, I find out he didn't. He goes in, opens up both sides, takes all my cartilage out. I had actually torn my ACL ligament, never repaired that. So during the course of these five years where I have creditors on me, I also have two more additional knee surgeries. The last one being I had to go up to Tahoe to have an experimental Gore-Tex ACL transplant done. I have two stainless steel molly bolts and artificial ligament. They drilled holes mm -hmm. through and run that in. So I'm battling all this while I'm trying to get these bills paid. Right. You know? uh, I mean, it was a nightmare. Right. Um, and, and I know from your perspective, I mean, you did everything you could. You, you, all through the brain surgeries, you were going to college to get your degree. Well, th this and, was prior. But once I settled my claim, once I won my claim in 86, because I was injured on the job, as any other employer is, is obliged by law, right. state of California, if you're injured on the job and you can no longer function in that position, they are obliged by law to retrain you in a field of work where you make a comparable amount of money. Now I was making back then what they called top, top wages. wages. Right. And when I finished my, my when I won my suit and my my and they owed my back hospital bills and in any future, and I thank God I won that. 
That was brain surgery two and three. I'm on brain surgery nine now. Right. And I don't, you can't get insurance for this stuff, and I, you don't pay for it. So when I won my case in 86, they, they offered me like 35000 to go away. I said, no, thank you. I want to keep my medical open, and I want to go back to school and finish my biology right. degree. And you did. Not knowing, though, that it would take me five more years because right. I had four more brain surgeries while I was at Sac State. Right. Finishing all, I had, you know, four semesters of chemistry and two semesters of physics. Right. And the point being, though, that you did persist, yeah. and, you, and you are, uh, you know, you have your own business. Right. And, you know, despite the fact that the brain surgeries and CTE that you suffered does diminish, you know, your, your abilities at time to time. I want to make the viewers aware that you're actually out there battling as, you know, as a professional out there, not trying to take the system or anything like that. Right. I mean, I've been diagnosed. When I went down to Amen's clinic, Dr. Amen's clinic, um, a year and a half or so ago, the first time, I've been under three times now, and I'm scheduled to go back down again um, July 6th, I believe. They just called me like yesterday. So, but uh, when I, my first evaluation, he did a, a three-day evaluation on me, right. 12 hours a day. And his, his evaluation was, I would have George rated at 100% disabled due to, and there's a list of 16 different things, you know, damage to the right frontal lobe, da 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 it went on and on and on. Right. Have I ever drawn anything? No. Okay. But, um, you know, I don't know. You might. Yeah, how much longer I can keep functioning, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. Now, before we go, we do have a, a young man in the audience who's going to model your rings. You want to come up and... It's my hero. Yeah. yeah. You want to introduce this young man? Uh, you know, it, it was Josh, right? Jonathan. 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 I was close. I got the J right. That's, that's okay. good. Jonathan, you want to hold yeah. your hand down? Maybe come George can here, help bud. him. Why don't you turn around there? There you go. Yeah. No, so these are two rings. He's, wearing, he's the, wearing the bling. <laughs> yeah. One is a uh, Super Bowl ring. There it That's is. That's it. Uh huh. And one of them is in a uh, orange bowl. Orange bowl ring. And Jonathan, uh, I hope to have back on our show at some point. Uh, you know, when we have another show, because he has his own story to tell. Yes, he does. And um, we want to thank you so much, Jonathan, for coming. This this right here is, is a hero right, right here you know, today. This is, this and guy uh, is, believe yeah, me, you're, sure you're, you're you're our hero. Yeah, so this is, this guy's thank you so special. much for coming on board. Yep. So thank you. Thank you. So now, um, I do want to I do want to get around to talking about some of the changes that we can make. I mean. What, what do we need to change at the high school level? Um, do you want Kevin? to take that? Or yeah, join um, Because you, yeah. because you, t yeah. you did coach some. Yeah, here. I did. I, yeah. I coached at uh, Humboldt State for a year um, in 06, and then actually I coached at Nevada Union for a couple of years as right. well. And you, you see high school kids, and you know we're not picking on anybody here, yeah. but no. there's high school kids who get dinged up and right. pretty much they either don't tell the coaches or right. sometimes they get sent back onto the field before they're really recovered. Yes. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, what they need to do is teach better techniques, um, which I think um, the uh, NU staff, you know, they actually do camps during the summertime, and they work on a lot of uh, tackling uh, techniques, which I think are helpful. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, what the trainers need to do, which I think they have a very good trainer, uh, his name is Jamie Wise, um, who I think is someone who wouldn't allow a coach to override him mm -hmm. on his uh, expert good. opinion, and he's, you know, sort of a new wave type of trainer, <laughs> where, you know, when I was in high school, the trainer, you know, especially if you were a star player, you were dependent upon a lot, you know, would do anything to get you back out there, lie to you and whatnot. Where you know, actually, I, I've seen Jamie, you know, take helmets and right. basically tell players, "No, you're not going back out." So we need a we need a medical intervention here, basically. We, we do. need some yeah. kind of reevaluation mm -hmm. to seriously look at you know what's going on here and 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 check a kid out um, before they get back out in the field, don't we? Absolutely. I think they need to be evaluated. And I think that's what parents need to do. Uh, like George and I said, we we love the game and yeah. we want the game to continue to grow. Um, this is more about, you know, raising awareness about concussions and, and precautions that need to be taken and maybe rules need to be changed and, and it's for the coaches and, you know, all the people involved in the game to take a look 
um, at what they're doing, how they're doing it, right. and make sure that they're, do, they're doing it for the better right. of the kids and the players. And we're and told I, that I like to use a term that really, you know, we're not not we're trying to save football yeah. because it is yeah. going down the same path as, right. as big tobacco was. They, they right. denied, denied, denied. So we need to. You touched on several yeah. different issues, but there's a lot. There's not a silver bullet. It's, it's you need uh, educating coaches. You know, um, with having the trainers and right. have, giving trainers full right. uh, power. Right. You know, there, there's a lot of pressure on folks uh, right. at every level. There is yeah. a trainer. What do you mean you're pulling him out of the right. game? You know what? So there needs to be. They need to be. You know, insulated from any repercussions or whatever. Uh, people need to know the long-term effects of this. I think that's a real eye opener for them. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean. We used to think you, oh, you, you know, you got your bell rung and you, right. you shook it off and you're okay. Well, we're, now we're, just, and I will say this, you know, we're just finding out a lot of the stuff. Maybe they knew about it earlier and they kept it squelched, like right. like Dr. Omalo's studies. Well, right. I got to tell you, I, I ran across a study that was actually sanctioned by uh, the NFL in 1994, and they found that in the head injuries where people had serious concussions, that the collision rate was a 20 mile per hour collision. And they knew that the reverberation of the brain inside the cranium was at eight and a half miles per hour. That's an incredible finding, mm-hmm. and that was in 1994. So I'm not so sure the NFL. Oh, they, they've known. They have put accelerometers in helmets. Okay, now keep in mind, a jet fighter pilot, when they're accelerating, they'll pass out between five and six Gs. Okay, mm-hmm. when they're accelerating, they've put accelerometers in helmets in, in players. And, uh, and a typical defensive lineman in the NFL will register 15 to 20 hits of 20 to 25 Gs per game. And DBs and linebackers have registered up to 100 Gs. Mm-hmm. Now, the reason why they don't pass out is because, it's, boom, it's a quick hit. The fighter pilot's a long, extended acceleration. Right. But what they're finding out now is that quick hit. You know, your, your, your brain is moving at that speed. Yep. And it's, it's sloshing Shocked around suddenly. in there. And yeah, it's stretching it's, those neurons, right. and they get inflamed, and then they start dying in your 30s, 40s, and 50s, as opposed to your 60s, 70s, and 80s for normal human beings. Right. You know? Now, one of the pictures we have, if we can find it, uh, George was um, kind enough and you know, brave enough to show us a brain scan of your brain. We've got about five minutes left. I'm not sure we can find it, but if we do, uh, let the control room just... You know, override me and uh, flash it up on the screen because it's graphic evidence yeah, of good. what your brain looks like when it's damaged the way it is. So let's talk a little bit about in the time we have left. What other things could we be doing, George? You you made a list out, right, and sent it off to the NFL to Dr. Allen Bogan. Yeah, I've been coordinating with him and Rich Allen Bogan when he came on board. I was very uh, leery, skeptical. <laughs> That's a very that's an understatement. Um, Rich, I, I, I truly believe Dr. Allen Bogan is the real deal. He's in this for the right reason. Um, he asked me, uh, gosh darn, a year and a half ago, a year ago last February. And, and the fact that I can bring these these dates out uh, is huge thing, for yeah. me. That it's only my treatments have been very helpful. But um, so I, he asked me for a, a set of rule changes that I thought could better protect players' heads. And he told me within a week he would convene a meeting with the NFL Rules Committee. And I sent them off two and a half pages, everything from training and education and, and uh, giving every player a, a microcog test before the season, a microcognitive test. So you have data. Uh, and baseline. A, a baseline data. data. And if a guy is concussed, he doesn't. I'm reading some of these recommendations, you know, it's like two weeks, three weeks. Well, everyone's different. You may have a guy that, that's 100% functioning within a week and someone else that may take four and a half weeks. Right. And, and it could be the... One guy has had a history of 20 concussions, and the other guy has five. But it's yeah, maybe the 20 were never even diagnosed either. Right. So, yeah. um, <clears throat> so I had everything in there from, from you know, preseason diagnostics to um, training to I had accelerometers in helmets. And, and if a player exceeded a certain thresh, not every helmet, but, but put them in a, right. a, a, a rotate them around. If a player exceeds a cer- certain g- uh, G-force, you know, whatever that may be, he's out of the game. Or if he exceeds a, a number at a lower level in a certain period, maybe that's enough to pull him out for a week or two. I mean, I don't know. These were just some ideas. That, right. um, we also discussed the other day. We might look at some of the. Uh, there's the. Uh, we have up on the, a picture now of um, George's uh, brain, and um, 
believe me, we're going to be talking more about this in a future show because we're going to try to talk about some of the treatment regimens that might be helpful. And that was after AD and hyperbaric after the, treatments. And, right. and, and uh, another um, treatment that I've had great results with, are, um, I've been using um, Dr. Barry Sears omega-3 fish oils. Right. Very simple uh, right. treatments. Um, right. And a hyperbaric chamber, which and the, gonna, and the we're going to focus on in a couple yeah. of weeks. Um, so, so overall, I think... You know, our objective is to be able to bring awareness to people, Absolutely. try to make sure that, you know, football players are well versed on what could happen to them, teach good technique, maybe look for some rule changes that uh, de-emphasize this uh, cultural violence and get back to the beauty of the game. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly looking at, you know, having impact on youth football and uh, high school football. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, there, I mean, very few kids are going to go on and play. We were fortunate enough to go right. on and play, in, right. and very few kids will go on and play in college, even. But right. I mean, it's a, it's a game. I tell people, it, it's still even at the professional level, it's a game for crying out loud. It's to entertain yeah. people. So, is it really worth? <clears throat> yeah, and when I look back, I don't want, you know, my highlight to be just that I, you know, got to, you know, get a full ride scholarship and I, you know, uh, got to play professional ball. You know, um, you know, really your highlights when you look back. Should be the the fact that you know you had you know children that were healthy and they succeeded and whatnot and I think you know some of the things and and where the game has gone you know today with all the different media that we have which is so different you know 25 years ago um, you know I love ESPN I watch it every day but you know there's so many different sports channels right. and so much pressure for coaches to win. You know, yeah. for them not to lose perspective right. on what's really important, and, and uh, right. I've seen that at uh, you know youth football, the high school yeah. football level, where I think right. you know um, you know not to get caught up with you know just trying to win and right. win at all costs. We got about thirty seconds <clears throat> left, so I want to we're going to wrap it up. Unfortunately, it's the yep. fastest hour on TV. I want to thank uh, Kevin Brown and George Visker. We're going to have you guys back, of course, on some future shows. Um, I want to thank the crew. I have uh, Sam and Janice in here, and I got uh, Jetta and uh, Marilyn and Diane, and of course uh, my producers, uh, um, Gail Woodman and the pug, her pug, Harley, who's one of the only pug producers in the world. <laughs> so this is Paul Manacucci wrapping it up saying goodbye until next time. <laughs>